The Story Without a Name by Barbie de Orvilly, Chapter 5. The next day, Madame de Fergeau sent Agatha for the doctor. Ah, the servant, with her customary frankness, exclaimed, Madame sees that Mademoiselle is ill. I could have told her so long ago, and I would have if Mademoiselle hadn't forbidden me and said that she didn't want to worry her mamma about an indisposition which would go of itself. But it has not gone all the same. I shall be glad to see the doctor, although. She did not say all she might have, for, superstitious as she was, she did not believe that the doctor would be of much service. Nevertheless, she ran off for him at once, and presently he came. He questioned the girl, but gathered little from her answers. Mademoiselle de Fergeau said merely that she felt a weariness and disgust of all things. Even for God, her mother bitterly threw at her. It was a question she could not withhold. So annoyed was she at the girl's refusal of the communion. Lastheny, who never complained, made no answer, but the question sounded in her ears like a prophetic threat of the future. She felt that her mother's piety might one day become cruel. Whether or not the physician understood what Mademoiselle de Fergeau's condition was, he gave no hint to the mother, and any uneasiness he might have had he kept to himself, with the idea, perhaps, of waiting until the girl's vague symptoms became more pronounced. At the same time, he spoke of the complications common enough in young girls of Lastheny's age, and recommended for her care and diet rather than medicine. All that is bosh, sniffed Agatha. Care and diet won't cure Mademoiselle. And, as a fact, there was no improvement in the singular mal malady which seemed to consume her. She became more listless, and the nausea increased. Do you want me to tell you what I think? Agatha said to Madame de Fragil one day, when they happened to be alone. The dinner was over, and Lastheny, to whom the sight of food was distressing, had gone to her room that she might rest a while in bed. Here is a whole month of the doctor's been coming, and for nothing. Three days ago he was here, she continued, violently. What I think is that Mademoiselle has more need of a priest to exercise her than a doctor who does no good. Madame de Fragil stared as though she fancied her suddenly attacked with madness. But the immense eyes of the mistress did not in the least frighten the servant. Yes, madame, a priest who can undo the devilish work of that capuchin. Madame de Fragil's eyes flashed. What? Do you dare to... Yes, madame. Agatha intrepidly retorted, I believe that Satan has passed this way, and that he has left what he leaves wherever he goes, when he can't damn the souls, it's the body he besets. Madame de Fragil made no reply. She put her head in her hands and rested her elbows on the table, from which Agatha had already removed the cloth. She was as religious as her servant, much more so, and what the woman had said pierced her heart like an arrow. In a moment she looked up. Leave me alone for a while. Then her frightened face sank again into her hands, and Agatha retreated backwards, the better to judge the effect she had produced by the thunder of a single word. Madame de Fragil was not superstitious, neither was she a mystic in the Christian sense of the term, but her faith was profound. What Agatha had said impressed her deeply. It was not that she would have denied the physical manifestations and visible influence of him who the Holy Writ entitled the evil spirit, she believed in these things calmly, doctrinally, in the exact measure that the Church, who is the mother of all prudence and the enemy of all fr frivolity, authorizes us to believe. Agatha's opinion impressed her, therefore, but to a lesser degree than it would have impressed one whose imagination was more exalted than her own. It conveyed to her an idea of which Agatha had no inkling. The woman within her, one who, after fifteen long years, still learned, yearned for her husband she had lost, revealed to her things which Agatha, in the celibacy of her heart and taciturnity of her senses, could hardly divine. Madame de Fragil believed, just as Agatha did, that Satan had in his service incarnations that are terrible. But by her own experience, she knew what Agatha did not, that of all of them, love is the most terrible. And abruptly, in a lightning flash, there came to her the thought that love was perhaps her daughter's disease. Her face was still in her hands, but her eyes, the eyes all of us might look down into the night of our souls, were fixed on that sudden thought. Yet, there being no decent society in the neighborhood, no attractive young men, and as she and her daughter passed the days in the solitude of an empty house, at once out of the night of her soul surged the image of an incomprehensible capuchin, 
who had sprung into their lives and vanished. As for the horror that Lastini had invariably exhibited for that fateful sphinx, who for a full forty days had dwelt impenetrably at her side, did it not show that she was not in love with him? Not at all. It showed, on the contrary, that she might love him madly. Women all know that. Even when their feminine instinct does not divine it, passion teaches. How often fear or hatred is the beginning of love? And what is horror but the union of fear and hate raised to their highest power? She feels towards you as she might to a spider, said a mother one day to a man that loved her daughter. A month after that humiliating speech, the poor mother was far from suspecting the culpable and hidden bliss from which the daughter let that spider suck from her heart its last drop of virgin blood. Lastini had trembled before the mysterious capuchin, but if a woman has not trembled before a man, never will she love him. Madame de Fergeol herself had trembled before the irresistible white soldier who had carried her off as Boreas carried off Erythia. She had only to remember her past, to fear for her daughter's future. At last, then he knows what is the matter with her, she reflected. She hides it. The mother recalled that when she had loved, she too had hidden it, for love readily turns to falsehood. It is voluptuous to glue to a burning face a mask that will devour it, and which shows, when it drops, the scar that nothing can hide. When Madame de Fergeau looked up again, she was calm, but she was determined to know the cause of her daughter's illness. To the doctor, she gave no further thought. It was for her to discover. Once more, she accused herself of her life's sin, that of always being more wife than mother. God continued to punish her, and that, she reflected, she deserved. Later, when Lastini returned from her room and took her seat in the embrasure of the window where both of them sewed, she would have been frightened had she seen her mother's eyes. But she did not see. There was never any tenderness there to attract her own, so she did not seek them. After a momentary silence, Madame de Fragel, who was mending some linen, looked up. How do you feel? Lastini bent over her work. Better, she answered, but from her eyes there fell perpendicularly and without touching the cheek two heavy tears. Madame de Fragel, her needle in the air, watched them fall, and she saw two others fall, larger and heavier than the first. What are you crying about? For you are crying, the mother asked in a voice that was both a reproach and an accusation. Lastini dried her eyes with the back of her hand. She was as pale as a ghost. I don't know, Mama. It is physical, I think. I too think it's physical, Madame de Fragil replied, laying stress on every word. Why should you cry? Why are you so miserable? Why are you unhappy? The burning black of the eyes of the mother transfixed the fair, wet eyes of the girl, drying them at once. Last then he absorbed her tears. The two needles went to work. Again there was silence. The scene was short but threatening. They both leaned over the edge of that abyss, lack of confidence which separates them, and they said nothing more that day. Silence became permanent between them, and what is sadder, more sinister even, than the intimacy of two people who have ceased to speak. In spite of her resolutions, Madame de Fragil, who feared to know, did nothing, and several dumb days passed. But finally, one sleepless night, in thinking of the silence that bowed them one in front of the other, oppressing both with, with the uneasiness which in itself was fright, Madame de Fragil became ashamed of her weakness. If she is a coward, she cried, so be it. I am not. She rose from the bed and took a lamp which burned all night in order that the sleepless she might see the crucifix that hung over her alcove and pray with greater fervor. Only now, instead of praying to it, she tore it violently from the wall and took it with her as a supreme resource against the maledictions she was going to seek and which she was going to find. It was needful to her to end at once the insupportable anxiety that beset her, and, all in white, like a specter, she entered her daughter's room the crucifix in one hand, the lamp in the other. She was fright itself, yet fortunately there was no one there to frighten. Lastini scarcely seemed to breathe. She had sunk into a dreamless sleep, that inanimate slumber which is like that unto death, and which at night overtakes those who during the day have suffered greatly. Madame de Fragil held the lamp above her head and let the trembling light fall from her trembling hand. Then, lowering it, she held it close to the sleeping child whose secret she sought to discover. 
Then at once she cried in horror, I was right! I see it in her face! A cry, parenthetically, which Lasthony did not hear, and which, if she had, she would not have understood. Yes, she continued, I see it! Putting the lamp on the table with one quick movement, she lifted the crucifix over the face of the girl and held it as she might have held a hammer with which she intended to crush what was there. For a second only, she held it so. Instead of falling on the sleeping girl, she turned the crucifix and struck herself violently with the frenzied desire to inflict on herself a ferocious and fanatic punishment. The force of the blow was such that the blood spouted and the noise of it awoke Lastheny, who, seeing the light, the blood that flowed, and the mother of her striking herself with a cross, cried out in terror, Ah, you who cry out now, do you? Madame de Fragil said with brutal irony. You did not cry out when... She stopped, fearful of what she was about to say, hesitating at what she thought. But in a moment she found new courage. Hypocrite! You knew how to be quiet, to hide everything, to cover it all up. You did not cry out, but your sin now cries out in your face, and everyone will hear it as I do. You did not know that there was a sign which tells all and never deceives, an accusing sign, and you have it. Lastheny, startled and terrified, understood nothing of what her mother said. In the sight of that horrible vision, she might have gone mad, perhaps, had not a swoon protected her. But, pitiless for the swoon which she was the cause, the implacable mother abandoned her daughter fainting on the bed, and... Falling to her knees, the crucifix in her upraised hands, she prayed aloud, kissing the crucifix as she prayed, and tearing her lips with her nails. My God, forgive me! Forgive her sin which I share, for I have not watched her enough. Like an ungrateful discipline in the garden of Gethsemane, I have fallen asleep, and the traitor came while I was sleeping. Let my blood, O Lord, be the expiation of her sin and of mine. She struck herself again on the breast and on the forehead, and the blood gushed forth. Let your cross be the means of my torture, Lord God of mercy. Sinking, she fell, overwhelmed at her sin and at the fear of eternal damnation.